Good morning to you all. Good morning, ma'am. Okay. So we will start uh, today's session with the shape of the distribution. Uh, <clears throat> The last two class, uh, we learned about the graphical uh, methods uh, for qualitative data and for quantitative data. Uh, in that, how we can organize them in the tables, uh, frequency table, uh, relative frequency table, um, then person frequency table, and some cumulative frequencies for the uh, quantitative data. Uh, and also some graphical methods, uh, the bar chart and pie chart for qualitative data and the histograms, frequency polygons or gives uh, such as for quantitative data. So the histogram that also for quantitative data. Today, uh, we are going to learn about the shape of the histograms, right? Especially for the quantitative data, how the quantitative data are distributed in what shape. That is very important. So when we are learning uh, about their distributions and about the assumptions for conducting some statistical inferences, we need the shape of the distribution. So by using the histogram, how we can identify the shape of the distributions, right? So first, we are going to uh, talk about the symmetric, right? A histogram is said to be symmetric if when we're drawing a vertical line down the center of the histogram, the two sides are identical in shape and size. That is a one part is a mirror look of the other part. So if we're taking, this is a shape, one histogram. So when we are drawing a vertical line through the center of this histogram, then when we are looking at the left-hand side and the right-hand side have the same shape and also identical, right? So now if you're looking at this, this is the third bar. And this, this is also a third bar. So here, both lengths are same. And all the positions also, similar positions. From this line, it is an equal length. And from this line, this is all equal. Then let, let this bar, this is also similar to this one. And this is also similar to this one. So when we are drawing a vertical line through the center of the histogram, then both sides are, are identical in shape and size, in both contexts, shape and size. This is also another histogram. Histogram means there is no gaps between the bars. And each and every bar has equal length usually. And the heights are different according to their frequencies. Right? So when we are looking at this, uh, histogram here also when we are drawing a line through the center point of this histogram then these two parts are identical in shape and size but here when we are looking at this uh, histogram all the class sizes or all the class intervals have the same frequency right so here the frequencies are different. For the first class, the frequency is this amount. And for the second class, this is the frequency. And for the third and fourth class have the same frequency. Uh, but in the fifth class has the frequency like in the second interval. And the sixth class, sixth class has a frequency like in the first class interval. But when we are looking at here, all the class intervals have same frequency. So it says as a uniformly distributed. It says as a uniformly distributed. <clears throat> when we are looking at this uh, histogram, 
This is also when we are drawing a vertical line down through the center. Then these both sides are identical in shape and size. So if we want to look at whether our histogram is symmetrical, what we have to do? First, we have to identify the <coughs> center of the histogram. And through the center of the histogram, you have to write the vertical line down. And then you look at whether two sides are <coughs> identical or two sides are sh same in shape and size. If so, then it's called this uh, histogram is called a symmetrical or symmetric. Right. Then the next, here these, all these, uh, these three histograms are symmetrical, right? But sometimes you will get the shape of the histograms like this kind. So hence, when we are drawing a vertical line through the center point of this histogram, then we couldn't identify both sides are identical in shape and size. Right? So sometimes uh, when we are looking at this histogram, what happened here? This left hand side, the left hand side of this histogram has a long tail comparing to this one. And when we are looking from the peak point, this is the model class of this histogram. When we are looking at the from this point, now here it has a long tail comparing to this side. Usually, uh, for the symmetrical, if it has a mode, then the mode will be the middle point. But in this case, it's not a middle. And also the left hand side, there is a very short tail. And for the right hand side, it is a long tail. So if the histogram is not symmetrical, then it is called as a, the shape of the histogram is Non-symmetrical or skewness. Non-symmetrical means it's a skewness. And if the in skewness, there are two types of skewness you have. One is a positively skewed, and the second one is negatively skewed. So if the right hand side, the tail of the right hand side of the histogram is long comparing to left hand side then that is positively skewed. When we are looking at this one, <coughs> even this is the center point we look at, then this left hand from the modest class, the long tail is towards left hand side. So that is called negatively skewed. So if your histograms both have this kind of pattern, then we say that it is a skewness. This histograms, shape of this histograms are skewness, skewed this histogram, right? So whether it's a skewed or symmetrical based on the shape and size of the histogram. Then another characteristics, the first characteristics we look at whether it is a symmetrical or non-symmetrical. Non-symmetrical means it's a skewed. So symmet symmetrical histogram or skewed histogram. Then another thing we can look at in the histogram is modality. Right? So looking at the model, how many modes are we have for the histogram? Mod mean the most occurrence class interval, which class intervals or which class interval has most number of the highest frequency, which class interval has the highest frequency. So that means within that um, class, the observations are occurred often. 
So when we are looking at the number of modes, it has one mod or two mod or more than two modes. If it has a one mod, then that is called a unimodal histogram. So a unimodal histogram means there is a single peak. Now we're looking at only this class interval has peak. First, if you're looking at drawing a line through the midpoints, frequency polygon, when we are drawing a polygon, it increases and reach its peak point over here, then start again to decreases. So then if it's so, then it's a single peak. When we are looking at here, it has two peaks. Why we are saying that two peaks? First, you look at this one. When we are drawing a frequency polygon, it increases and reach this point. Again, it decreases. From this point, again, it increases and to reach here and then again decreases. So here, two different peaks it has. Start to increase, reach a highest point and then again to decrease. If that pattern is there, then where it, the point reaches as a highest point, that is a model class. So accordingly, it has two peaks. The, this histogram also has two peaks. You look at here. It increases and then it decreases. Again, it increases and then decreases. So these two peaks here. Now, so it calls a bimodal class, right? A histogram with two peaks is called as a bimodal histogram. Now, when we are looking at these two histograms, these two has a bimodels, right? But however, in this case, the frequencies are different. So for this model, the frequency is given by this length. And for this class, the frequency is given by this one. So here, two different frequencies. But anyway, we are looking at these other models. But in this histogram, these two model classes have same frequency distribution, right? The length is same to this length. So by model with the same amount of frequencies for this histogram, this is also by model, but the difference, uh, the histograms uh, modes are different. Okay. Similarly, if more than two peaks, a histogram consists of more than two peaks, then that is called a multimodal histogram. Right? So, mostly when we are looking at the histograms, and also we can look at the range of the histograms, how these data are spread to what length. When If you want to compare the histograms, these three points you can look at. First one is the shape whether it is a symmetrical or skewed. Uh, when it's skewed, then we can look at whether it is uh, positively skewed or right skewed, negatively skewed or left skewed. That is first case. Then we can look at the model modality of the histograms. Uh, looking at the peaks, how many peaks a histogram consists of. Uh, whether it's a, a unimodal, or whether it is a bimodal or it's a multimodal. If it's a unimodal, there must be a single peak. If it's a bimodal, it has two peaks. Uh, even in the two peaks, uh, sometimes both class have the same frequency or both class have different frequency. And if it's a multimodal, uh, more than two peaks. And then when we are looking at um, this uh, length, how these bars are spread with the same um, call scales. When we are taking the horizontal axis with the same scales, how these uh, histograms are, the bars are spread out. 
right? If it's a, this length is very narrow or small, then it is a small range it consists. If the length of all these bars are very large, then um, the range is very high, right? When we are looking at uh, <clears throat> uh, here, how many mods? This is a single peak, one mod. This is the model class. Here also single peak, one mod. So it is a positively skewed with one mod. It is also negatively skewed with one mod. Right. <coughs> In this case, what about this diagram? How many mods are here? Put in the chat box for the first histogram, how many mods? For the first histogram, how many mods are there? Is it a single peak or by model or one model or multi model? Put in the chat box. By model, yes, because this class interval and this class interval has uh, same frequency uh, with the uh, different classes, but has same frequency. So it's a by model and also symmetrical. What about this second? <clears throat> How many models are there? Whether this histogram has any modes. What do you answer? What about the modality or mod mode of this histogram? First, you look at what is the mode and how we identify. Apply that point for this histogram and say and find out whether it has any modes or not. No, that's wrong. Six multi model. Model means what is the mode means? There must be a peak. Right? The definitions of mode, there must be a peak. Peak means first increasing, reaching a highest point, again then decreasing. Or comparing to other bars, there must be a one bar that consists of larger number of frequency. That is a mode. When we are looking at here, each and every bar has same length. There is no any peaks over here. This is a uniformly distributed. So there is no mod. This histogram or this distribution has not any mod. So what is your answer here? There is no mod for this histogram. This is a uniformly distributed. So six means multimodal means there are different peaks. Right? But here you look at there is no peaks. So, if you want to identify whether there is any model class, you have to find out whether any class interval or any bar, one of the bar has a highest frequency within the groups or not. But here, 
all have same frequency. So there is no mode for this frequency distribution. But it is symmetrically distributed. No mode with symmetrically distributed. Right? Right. Now what about the this? Um, histogram. <laughs> How many modes are there for this histogram? <laughs> Look at by whether among these, <coughs> there are six bars. Among these six bars, are there any bars have the high, largest frequency? Here, when we are looking at in this <coughs> histogram, little bit different this <coughs> histogram. Actually, it has two modes. Now we're looking at here. This is starting with the peak point x and then decreasing for this first half. For the first group, uh, highest with a starting from the highest point and then decreasing. But for the second group, it's increasing and then reach a highest point. So here also, two modes are there by model uh, this uh, histogram. But these by models have same frequency, equal length or equal frequency modes, right? But anyway, it has two modes. But it's not like uh, increasing, uh, reach a peak point and then again decreasing. That point is not here. But however, there are two peaks are here. For the first group, uh, the very left hand side, it has peak. And for the right hand side group, the very right side, it has a peak. So it is a bimodal histogram. Symmetrically bimodal histogram. Right? Uh, so when we are asking to describe the shape of the distribution, you have to look at the, when if we ask to describe the shape of the distribution, you have to look at the two points. What are the two points you put in the chat box? If you want to describe the shape of the distribution, right? What are the two points you have to look at? Put in the chat box your answer. What are the two characteristics we have to look at? <laughs> Write your answers. Now, so far, we discuss about these two characteristics. So, now you put it. What are the two characteristics we are looking at to describe the shape of the distribution? What is the first thing we look at? Symmetric. Whether the histogram is symmetrical. Right? If it is a symmetrical, then we can identify the histogram has uh, the shape of the histo uh, identical in shape and size. It's a symmetrical. Two sides are identical in shape and size when we are drawing a vertical line through the center of the histogram. If it's not symmetrical, then uh, we say that it's a skewed histogram. Uh, skewed, uh, there are two uh, different skewed we can identify, left skewed and right skewed. Then we looked at about the modality, whether it is a single peak 
one model or bi model or multi model sometimes it has no marks so to describe the shape of the distribution we have to look at the symmetrical and modality right what are the two things we have to observe to describe the shape of the histogram symmetrical and the modality right right then bell shape this is the special case of a shape of the histogram <coughs> bell shapes may a special type of symmetrical unimodal histogram is one that is called a bell shaped <coughs> this bell shaped is very important for most of the statistical techniques to apply right so many statistical techniques require that the population should be bell shaped <coughs> so to identify whether our histogram is a bell shaped then you have to draw the histogram and then look at whether first you have to look at whether it is a symmetrical and whether it has only one model single mode then if it's so then we can say that it is a bell shaped <coughs> so when we are looking at this model it is a symmetrical because when we are drawing this vertical line through the center point of this histogram this both sides are <coughs> identical in shape and size right here this is equal length this is equal length because this part is a mirror look of this part right uh, and then how many peaks are there only one peak is there for this is the class interval one peak so it is a symmetrical unimodal then we can say that the graph is bell shape so if we want to say bell shape the two characteristics we have to look at whether it is a symmetrical and whether it has one peak if so then we can say that the shape of the histogram is bell shape right now we are coming again for the these histograms <coughs> what about these three histograms whether these are the bell shape or not could you answer in the chat box whether these three histograms are bell shaped or not just right yes or no Yes, all these three are not bell shaped because uh, here are two peaks. So, different, uh, definitely we can eliminate from this bell shaped because only one single peak should be there, but it has two peaks. Here it has one peak. However, when we are drawing a line through this one, then this length is different than this length right so it is a non symmetrical it has one peak but non symmetrical it is a skewed so there is it's not a bell shaped right now another question when we are looking at this histogram whether it is a right skewed or left skewed put your answer in the chat box when we are looking at the shape of this histogram we say that it is a it's not symmetrical one peak but not symmetrical if it's not symmetrical then we can say that whether it is a left skewed distribution or right skewed distribution looking at the length of the tails right now can you find out whether it is a left skewed distribution or right skewed distribution Could you answer in the chat box?
if it's a left skewed then the left tail is longer than the right tail right if it is a right tail then right tail is longer than the left tail so it is a right tail is longer than the left tail so it is a right skewed distribution right because when we are taking the poly if you draw the frequency polygon then this tail is longer than the this tail so it is a right skewed distribution or positively skewed distribution here because there are two groups so actually um uh When we are looking at the highest peak, if you're looking at the highest peak, comparing to these two peaks, it is a highest peak. So if you take this as a highest peak, then what about this uh, left or right skewed? Take the highest peak bar and from that look at the length of the tails and accordingly say that whether it is a right skewed or left skewed. Looking at, no, if this is the length. So here only, this is the tail. But here, if you're looking at this one, this tail. Right? Approximately when we are putting this one, this is the longer tail. This part is longer part. Comparing to this part, when we are looking at this as a highest peak class interval, then this part is shorter than this part. So it is a left tail test. Right? So to look at whether it is a right skewed or left skewed with a bimodal class or multimodal class, you have to take a high, highest peak class interval. From that, look at the length. Right? So here, uh, this is this class interval has the highest peak. So when we are looking at length, this is shorter than this amount. So it is a left tail. Left tail is longer than the right tail. So it is a um, left skewed or negative skewed distribution. What about this one? Here actually uh, both way you can say that because here these two modes has equal length. These two mode model classes have equal length. So two modes are equal. So if you're looking at this one, then here this is the short. Right? And this part is long. So it is a right tail. If you're looking at this one. This is shorter than this amount. So in this case, it is a left skewed. Right? Uh, but anyway, if we take the center point, if we take if we take this center point, then when we are drawing this line, what will happen? Uh, even not symmetrical, right? Even though if we are taking a, this line, uh, not symmetrical because symmetrical means in the shape and size, both are similar, identical, right? But when we are looking at, it is a non-symmetrical. Only we can say that even it is a right tail or long uh, left tail skewed, it is very difficult to say that. We can say that non-symmetrical with two modes. Non-symmetrical with two modes by model, right? <coughs> uh, then here, one mode with positively skewed. Here also one mode with negatively skewed. 
And here, uh, is it bell shaped? This histogram. Put your answer in the chat box whether this histogram is bell shaped or not. Not yes, because it has a symmetrical but two peaks. So this uh, number of peaks is violated here, right? So it is a not bell shaped curve, but symmetrical with bimodal, but not bell shaped. Uh, this is also not bell shaped. There is no symmetrical, but no peaks there. And here also not bell shaped uh, because it's a symmetrical. However, there is no single peak. Right? So now you are able to identify what is symmetrical, uh, what is modality, whether it is a single model or bimodal or multimodal. Then again, the specific or special characteristics bell shape. If it should be a bell shape, there is a symmetrical with single peak. That peak divides both sides of the histogram are identical in shape and size. Right? So these are the characteristics we can identify by using the histogram, shape of the histogram. Then another part, this is also very important uh, to find out to identify to find out the insights of the data set using the histograms. Uh, sorry, using the data. Uh, that is called one of the exploratory data analysis. <laughs> it consists of simple arithmetic, easy to draw pictures that can be used to summarize data quickly. One such technique is the stem and leaf display. That is also already we learned the histogram also, exploratory data analysis. This is another kind of uh, technique, stem and leaf display. Uh, when we are learning about the numerical measures for the data, then again, one of the exploratory data analysis technique we will look at, uh, that is called as a box plot. Right. Now we look at what is a stem and leaf display. <coughs> In the stem and leaf display, actually, this is a technique commonly used. Uh, <coughs> if you want to organize the data, uh, without losing its originality or without losing the original data, then definitely we have to go for the stem and leaf display. So when we are organizing this data in a stem and leaf display, it will not lose the original data. It shows the original raw data. Right? So the main advantage of this one, actually, when we are organizing the data in the frequency table, right, in the frequency distribution uh, with a grouped class, the road original data will be lost. Uh, that means only we can say that now when we are looking at, uh, suppose, a frequency distribution, now we look at looking at this frequency distribution. Uh, we say that uh, the class interval 10 to 20, but not 20 is included. There are 10 observations. Right? Only we can say that there are 10 observations in the class interval 10 to 20. But we can't say that what, the, what is each and every value. Only these values are 10, more than 10 or more than 10, but less than 20. All those values. But we couldn't say that what is the 
what are those 10 values or the what are the original 10 values we can't say that but if we using a stem and leaf display then we can identify the original values of the data that is the advantages of stem and leaf display over frequency distribution right <coughs> So that is the first point. The stem and leaf display technique is commonly used as it offsets the loss of information that occurs from summarizing the raw data. When we are summarizing the raw data in the frequency table with a grouped class intervals, then definitely we are losing the raw data information. But when we are summarizing the data using stem and leaf display, the raw data we can identify the raw data. So, to organize those raw data in the stem and leaf display, each value is divided into two portions. Right? The stem is the leading digit, that is actually the left hand side digit. It may be one digit or two digits you can take according to the uh, raw data. And Trailing digit is the leaf, that is the right hand side of the digits. Stem is placed to the left of a vertical line and the leaf is to the right. So an advantage of stem and leaf display over a frequency distribution is that we will not lose information on individual observations. Individual observations are able to identify when we are summarizing the data as a stem and leaf display. <laughs> this display only we can construct for quantitative data, not for qualitative data. From this display also, you can both the rank order, that is order array also we can have, and also you can identify the shape of the distribution, whether it is a symmetrical or non-symmetrical, how many modes are there, whether it is a bell-shaped or non-bell-shaped, and whether it's a right-skewed or left-skewed. What are the shapes we can identify through the histogram? Uh, by the stem and leaf display also, we can identify these kinds of characteristics as uh, insights of the data. So the stem and leaf plot, each number is separated into a stem, uh, usually the entries leftmost digits and the leaf usually the rightmost digit. So here we are looking at the stem and leaf. Uh, this is an example of exploratory data analysis. Uh, here we having a data. Uh, this represent ages of 30 students in a statistic class. Now we want to summarize uh, those 30 students' ages in a stem and leaf plot, right? Now, when we are looking at, uh, this is our uh, this ages given to you. Now we are looking at the minimum age is 18 and the maximum age is 54, right? So now uh, we are looking at uh, 18 tens numbers in the first row, 20s numbers in the second row, 30s numbers in the third row, 40s numbers in the fourth row and 50s number in the fifth row. So our first line starting with a, a 10 to 20, but not, uh, but less than 20. <coughs> so here the ages are 18, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 in such manner. So now we are looking at taking the age 18, first thing, as a stem and leaf display, we have to divide into two parts. One is a stem and other part is leaf. 
the leftmost we are taking as a stem and the rightmost digit we are taking as a leaf. <coughs> so here only the two digits. So we are dividing into two portions. Left part is uh, left side number is stem and the right number is leaf. So we are placing one here. Then we are putting the vertical line. Then uh, we are taking similarly for the 20, uh, 20s numbers, 2 is the stem. In the 30s number, 3 is the stem. For the 40s, 4 is the stem. For the 50s, 5 is the stem. Then put the vertical line. <coughs> then now we have to put the leaves. So 18, you put 8 here. Then 20, put 0 here. <coughs> then 21. Uh, put one here. So, if you want to look at in the ordered array, the first thing you have to order them in the ordered array. Put them in these numbers in the ordered array. After put them in the ordered array, then you can construct this stem and leaf display easily. <coughs> ordered array means we have to arrange this data in the order of magnitude. Right? So 18, 19, uh, then only 1, 19, 18. How many 18s are there? Two 18s. After that, 20s. How many 20s? Um, two 20s are there. Similarly, arrange them, all the 30 data, arrange them in the ordered array from increasing to decrease, from increasing order, smallest to largest, and then put them in the order. So, three 18s are there. Uh, this is 118, this is 118, this is another 18. So, 18, 18, 18, then 19, 19, 19, 20, 20, then 21, 21, 21. Similarly, it is a 29. 29s are two times. Then 30s are two times, 32 are two times, 33 is one time, 34 is one time. Similarly, you can look at how many times each and every observation occurred. And also, we are having the original data. <coughs> we can identify the raw data. Right? So, when we are looking at this shape, right, now you put, uh, find out the insight from this, looking at this age of the distributions, right? Find the insights. First, you think about, so from this shape, what are the insights we can get uh, regarding the shape, whether it is a symmetrical or non-symmetrical? What about the modes, whether it is a single mode or bi mode or two models? After that, then whether it's a bell-shaped or non-bell-shaped, right? So uh, looking at this uh, stem and leaf display, summarize these characteristics. I'm giving a three or four minutes time. Then you roughly find out the insights from this, uh, insights as a shape of the stem and leaf display and put in the chat box. What about the shape of the distribution? And if you're looking at drawing this one, like uh, this shape you will get. Right? According to that, what is the shape of the distribution?
there each line you have to take each bar each line you have to take as a each bar of the histogram right each rows right each rows you have to consider bar of the histogram so it's like a horizontal histograms right horizontal not a vertical it is a horizontal histogram and accordingly now you have to find out We got one answer. Check that answer. <clears throat> symmetrical bimodal right tail. If it's a symmetrical, then how you will get the right tail? Uh, first one, single mod, not symmetrical, right skewed. Right. This is the correct answer. Who's this student? MS147, your answer is the perfect, right? It has a single mod, not symmetrical in shape, but right skewed, right? That is the perfect answer, right? This is the first bar length, and this is the second bar length, and this is the third bar, and this is the fourth bar, this is the fifth bar. So it is a not symmetrical, right? Because when we are drawing a line through this uh, model class, then this length is very shorter than this length. So it is not symmetrical. So when we are looking at the length, the right hand side length is larger than the left hand side length. So it is a right skewed. Then only single mod. So not bell shaped. So this description is perfectly right. But MS34, your answer is very confusing uh, because you put it as a symmetrical, not symmetrical. Because when we are drawing a line over there, the two parts are different in size and in shape. They are not identical, the two groups are. And also by model. How you are saying that by model only this bar has the highest length. So it's not the by model. And if you if you put symmetrical, then how you can tell that it is a right tail. So you have to again learn about the shapes of the histogram clearly. Because when you are looking at uh, to describe the shapes. You have to first, what are the concepts we are looking at in the histogram? That is very important, whether it is a symmetrical. Then you have to know that what is the meaning of symmetrical. If it's non-symmetrical, then we are looking at whether it is a right skewed or left skewed. Then what is the point we have to look at to decide whether it is a right skewed or whether it is a left skewed. Then when we are looking at the number of modes, how we are identifying the number? What is the mode? If it is a one mode, then how we are looking at saying it's one mode. If it's bimodal, then how we are saying that it's a bimodal. If it's multimodal, then how we have to say that it's multimodal. For each and everything, we have a concept to identify what are the things we have to look at. That's point you have to clearly know that. Then whether it's a bell shaped then how we have to find out whether it's a bell shape, right? All these points are very clearly you have to know, then there is no issues in defining the shape of the distribution, right? So you note these are the answers for the 
shape of this um, stem and leaf display, we can identify. <coughs> right. Uh, so this graph allows us to see the shape of the data as well as the actual values. Just without this raw data, if we are giving this um, stem and leaf display, then you can organize them. You can identify what are the raw values we have. Those raw values are placed in the ordered uh, order of magnitude. And also, we can create the frequency distribution. From this stem and leaf display, you can create the group frequency distribution. The first group is 10 to 19. The second group is 20 to 29. The third group is 30 to 39. And the fourth group is 40 to 49. And the fifth group will be 50 to 59. Then in the first class, how many, uh, frequent, how many observations are there? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six observations. In the second class, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten observations. Right? In the third class, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine observations. In the second class, we have three observations. And the last class, we have only two observations. So, from this, you can create the frequency distribution also. Right? And also, one of the another inside we have, most of the values lie between 20 to 39 because there are nine observations and here there are eight observations. So, almost 70 observations are from 20 to 39. Right. Then again, uh, another type of uh, stem and leaf plot we are constructing with the two lines for each stem. For each stem, we are two lines. The same uh, classes we are taking. Right. So we are taking first 10 to 15 as a one stem or one row. Then in the second row also, 10 to 14 uh, or 10 to 15. Mm, I think we have a bit of five, uh, fives are not there. Uh, so 10 to 15, uh, 16 to 19, 20 to 24, or 25 to 29, in such manner we are creating the rows. So each stem we are dividing into two rows. Right. So now here we look at here, the shapes are a little bit different comparing to the previous one. Right. Now looking at this stem and leaf display, could you uh, describe the shape of the distribution? Right. Looking at this stem and uh, leaf display, what is the shape of the distribution? Put in the chat box. First put whether it is a symmetrical or non-symmetrical. That point you have to find out first. Then look at the number of modes. How many modes are here? And then find out whether it is a bell-shaped or not bell-shaped. These three points you have to find out for this stem and leaf display.
write uh, first about the shape. Uh, that means whether it is a symmetrical or non-symmetrical. You put in the chat box for that answer first. That is easily you can identify. Right, non-symmetrical. Now you find out it's a non-symmetrical, right? Now you look at the number of modes, whether it is a single peak or more than one uh, peaks. If more than one peaks, then how many peaks are there? Put that answer. How many peaks are there? No, not one peak. Two peaks. Um, one peak is this one, increasing, reach a highest point, then decreasing. Increasing, reach a highest point, then decreasing. Again, it's increasing. Actually, um, two, four peaks are there. This one, this one, and these also are looking at here, decreasing, then increasing. Right? So, actually, it is a multimodal class. More than two peaks. So, it is a multimodal class. So, how we are looking at the peaks in the histogram? Uh, how many groups have a different peaks? Right? So, here each and every uh, rows we are looking at the bars. Right? So, this is one peak. This is another peak. And these two also peaks because increasing then decreasing. Right? So, there are four modes, but the different lengths, the length of the peak bars are different. So, different modality are there. Right? And also, it's not bell shaped. And uh, uh, roughly, if you're looking at the very highest peak among these one, it is a left skewed distribution. Roughly, we can say that. The long right tail is very long. Eh? So, sorry, not left skewed, right skewed. Right? So, uh, from this point of view, we can say that it is a right tail test, the right tail uh, skewed distribution. Right? So, now we look at when the groups are different, when we are arranging the uh, data with the different, different groups then the shapes also will change, right? So now we look at this one. For the same data, uh, sorry. Now here you look at, for this same data, when we are organizing those data in the stem and leaf display as one line for each tens, uh, twenties, there is no any breakdown for the this row. Then it has a single peak, right skewed distribution. Only one mod class is there. But for the same data, when we are organizing uh, those data uh, in the in such kind of stem and leaf display, right? For each two lines for each stem, when we are organizing them, then we got different shape. So this one, when we are constructing the stem and leaf display or histogram with the different groups, 
then we will get the different shapes right so it will percent to percent how they are organizing their data with the classes so percent to percent the shapes also will be different that is the one major disadvantages for constructing the data in the histogram or with a stem and leaf display if we are choosing the researchers are choosing their own the class intervals then you will get the different shapes right now so far we look at our shapes and the insights organizing the data for the tables and the diagrams for the qualitative and quantitative data for the single variable right now so far we learned how we can organizing the data in the form of uh, tables and in the form of graphs or diagrams for a single variable and we learned how we can derive insight from those tables and the graphs and diagrams now we are moving in one step advance looking at the two variables at the same time we are going to look at the two variables at the same time so to organize two variables at the same time two different techniques we are going to learn one is the cross tabulations uh, and the clustered bar charts and other one is the scatter diagrams for qualitative data we are going to use the cross tabulations and the clustered bar chart and for the quantitative data we are going to organize them as a scatter diagrams right So, we have focused on methods that are used to summarize the data for one variable at a time. But uh, in most of the times, uh, not only one variable, we are looking at the relationship between the two variables. Right? So, if we want to look at the relationship between the two variables, we can organize them in the table form and some graphical methods. Uh, those methods will help to understand the relationship between two variables. Such kind of graphical methods and the tables are called cross tabulation and the scatter diagrams. In those two methods, we can summarize the data for two variables simultaneously. So first we are looking at the cross tabulations. The cross tabulations we are often calling as contingency table. Right? The cross tabulation is often called contingency table. This contingency table helps to organize two or more categorical variables. Here we are limiting with the two variables for your case, right? We are because here we are doing manually. So we are limiting to two variables. So if you have two categorical variables, then we can organize those two categorical variables in the contingency table format. Then using this contingency table, we can study the patterns of the two categorical variables. So in this contingency table, it's cross tabulated or tallies jointly the responses of the categorical variables for that case we are uh, we are saying as a cross tabulations it is cross tabulate that is uh, we are looking at uh, the tallies with the where the row and the column are intersected that is the joint tallies right for two variables the tallies for one variable are located in the rows and the tallies for the second variables are located in the columns. But then when that where those the row and the column are intersecting, uh, that is a joint tallies, right? <laughs> right. Now you look at this, uh, read these spines, right? And identify the two variables we have 
in this case and put those two variables names in the chat box. What are the two variables here we are considering? Right? Read this case, right? Or this example. And from the given information, find out what are the two variables we are considering and put them in the chat box. That is your first task. <coughs> I am giving five minutes time.
whatever we want to <coughs> describe or uh, find the insights, first thing you have to identify the variables properly. Otherwise, it is very difficult to interpret them. So that's why I'm asking to write the variable. What are the variables? Here, two variables we consider. Based on the given information, you can identify what are the variables we considered, right? So put them in the chat box. At least one of the variable name, you put it. Size of the invoices and the presence of errors, right? This is okay, right? Now, first one, we are considering the size of the invoices and whether the errors are presented in the errors, um, errors are presented in the invoices or not. So, status of the presence of errors, status of the presence of errors. Right. This answer is right for the variables names. Uh, even uh, you are looking at this uh, uh, title also. Frequency of invoices categorized by size and the presence of errors, right? So, how many observations we considered? A random sample of 400 invoices is drawn, right? From the large scale of um, retail center or uh, supermarkets, uh, they are selecting a random sample of 400 invoices. Then the second point, point says that each invoice is categorized as a small, medium, or large amount, right? So that indicates the size of the invoice. There are three sizes they are categorizing. One is the small amount, one other one is the medium amount, other one is the large amount. Then also, each invoice is also examined to identify there are any errors. So status of the presence of errors. If there are no errors, then we will put no errors. If there are errors, then that consists of errors. So presence of errors is another variable. Then this data are then organized in the contingency table to the right. This is the organizing of your according to the uh, characteristics of the invoices. They are organized. So in the row wise, they are organizing the size of the invoice and the columns indicates the presence of the errors. No errors and the errors. Right. Now, again, we are coming for the variables. Right. Now, we want to classify. First, you consider the variable size of the invoice. Right. You put whether it is a qualitative data or quantitative data. And then find out whether it is a discrete data or continuous data and the level of measurement. Is it nominal, ordinal, interval or ratio? For the first table, variable size of the invoices, put your answers in the chat box. For the size of the invoices whether it's a qualitative or quantitative. Put your answer in the chat box. You put the answers quickly. Whether the variable size of the invoices, is it qualitative variable or quantitative variable? Right, it is a qualitative variable, right. Now, it's a qualitative variable. Uh, is it discrete or continuous? Put the answer for that one. Another classification. 
the first classification qualitative or quantitative the second classification whether the variable is discrete variable or continuous variable To identify whether it is a discrete or continuous, you have to look at the measures. Uh, so here, what are the measures we got? Small amount, medium amount, and the large amount. So whether we are measuring with the individual values or we are measuring with the values from a certain interval. Accordingly, you can identify whether it is a discrete or continuous. MS-147, what is your answer? Put in the chat box. So many times we practice them. Is it a discrete variable or continuous variable? Easily you can put it is a qualitative variable. So whether can we measure the qualitative variable in the interval scale or in the values between the certain interval? No. All are the individual values. So these individual values are small amount, medium amount and large amount. So it is a discrete variable. Right? Then what is the level of measurement? You write the answer for this one. The level of measurement, whether it is an ordinal or nominal or ratio or interval, that is the level of measurement. What is the level of measurement for this variable? For the size of the invoices. Right answer. It is an ordinal, right? Because here we can compare the amount, right? The small amount, this is the lowest value comparing to other two, medium and large. Large amount, this is the largest amount comparing to the small amount and the medium amount. So we can arrange them in the order. So it is an ordinal. Similarly, the presence of errors, that is also qualitative variable and the discrete variable. But what is the level of measurement? Is it ordinal or nominal or uh, ratio or interval? Write the answer for that one. For the presence of errors. Hmm. How you are saying that it is a ratio? It's a variable, it's a qualitative variable. Right? It is a discrete variable. Here, no errors. And if there are errors, yes. Then how do you are saying that it is a ratio? These are the frequencies. The 170, 20, 140, 65, 5 are the frequencies. We are asking them whether the invoices has errors or not. That is the actual variable. Whether the invoices has errors <coughs> or not. If they have errors, then here we put the tallies. If they don't have errors, then we put the tallies here. <coughs> so here, we can't compare. Only the answers are yes or no. So still you have some confusions with the variables and their measurements. Right? So the ratio is entirely wrong answer because we are saying that the presence of errors are the qualitative variable 
then how you can put the ratio measurement? So qualitative variable means only we can measure with the labels. Right? So only two possibilities are for the qualitative variables measurements. One is the ordinal measurements or the nominal measurements. If it's the ordinal, then we can compare the measures from the lowest to highest. But for the nominal, we cannot compare. So here the measures are just so no. So whether we can say that yes is better than no. no. So here it is a nominal measurements. Right? So still there is a space to improve yourself. Right? So you couldn't identify clearly whether it's a, a nominal measurement or ordinal measurement or interval or ratio. Then even whether it is a discrete variable or continuous variable and whether you have still doubt with the <coughs> names of the variables. So still you have to study clearly. Right? So now here we have the two variables. One is the <coughs> size of the invoices and other one is the status of the presence of errors. Size of the invoices are measured with a small amount, medium amount, large amount. So accordingly, it is a qualitative variable, discrete, and the measurement is ordinary. For the status of the presence of errors, qualitative variable and the discrete variable, but the measurement scale is nominal. And these are the frequencies. For 170 means out of 400 invoices, 170 invoices are no errors with small amount. Out of 400, these 40 invoices are with medium amount and with no errors. So these indicate how many invoices. These are the frequencies. Then out of 400, 335 invoices are no errors. And 65 invoices are with errors. And when we are looking at the raw totals, out of 400, 190 invoices are with small amount, 140 invoices are with medium amount, 70 invoices are with large amount. Such kind of insights we can get from the cross tabulation table. So to understand perfectly your summary data, then this is a frequency table, but we have with the two variables. So if we are organizing the data with a cross tabulation or contingency table with the two invoices, two variables, but it also frequency table with two variables. Right. Then here you look at some interpretations here I put and how we are calculating those percentages and how we are interpreting them here also indicated. So, so you learn yourself, right? These uh, interpretations. <coughs> Similarly, for other figures also, you can make the interpretations. Uh, then we are looking at the raw data here. Three tables here we are uh, making the interpretations. One is the overall figures, right? The first table, this is indicates with the overall amount. With a hundred percentage, how much of these amounts, right? Then the second table indicates with the row, ta row totals interpretations. By rows, how we are making the interpretations. And third one, column total. Right? So you have to learn how each and every table are distinct used. And also you have to know that if it's overall, how we can make the interpretations. By row wise, how we can make the interpretations. By column wise, how we can make the interpretations. These three cases are here. And for each and every one examples also for each and every case you have, based accordingly, you have to make the organize, uh, interpretations for other cells also. 
then how we are organizing them in the clustered bar chart if it's a, we are organizing them into the uh, two variables at a time then we have to use the clustered bar chart right here the same diagrams we have the clustered bar chart and also here one interpretation is over here similarly you have to find out other interpretations that is for self learning because with the example here i am leaving for this uh, how we have to construct these bar charts clustered bar charts and how we are making the interpretations you have to learn from this slide <clears throat> this is another chart here you try to uh, find out the insights from this clustered bar chart accordingly how here we are getting the insights from here similarly you have to apply the knowledge to get the insight from this uh, bar chart uh, stack bar chart right from this one uh, but the scenario is different from the titles and the rows uh, horizontal axis title vertical axis titles you can identify what are the things we are presented here even the legends also here indicate what are the things here we are organizing so without your raw data looking at this diagram what are the insights you can get find out them right if you have any doubts on this, uh, finding the insights, you can, uh, when you are bringing your answers, then you can clarify whether your answer is right or wrong, right? Then scatter plot. Um, here we are looking at the numerical value. So far, we look at two categorical variables. That is for the qualitative variables, either it's the nominal or ordinal level of measurement how we can organize them in the table and how we can organize them as a charts for charts clustered bar charts and for the tables cross tabulation or contingency we learned but when we are having the two numerical variables and how how they can organize in a chart here we are using the scatter plots <laughs> scatter plots are used for numerical data it's consisting of paired observations taken from the two numerical variables. So one numerical variable is on the vertical axis and the other one is in the horizontal axis. Through the scatter plots, we, have, we can find out the tendency of the relationship. That means what is the possible relationship existing between the two numerical variables. So when each entry in one data set corresponds to an entry in the another data set, these sets are called paired data sets. A paired data set means <coughs> for the same object, we have two measurements, right? Uh, so when we are measuring with the one characteristics for a variable, at the same time, for the another characteristics for the same object, we have to measure. And then when we are organizing them in the pair date format. <laughs> so to draw the scattered plot, the ordered pairs are graphed as the points in the coordinate plane. Right? One is in the horizontal and the other one is in the vertical. But both variables are quantitative variables. It may be discrete or continuous, but it have a quantitative numerical measure should be there. So the measurements may be uh, interval scale measurements or the ratio scales measurements, right? Uh, the following scatter plot represents the relationship between the number of absences from a class during the semester and the final grade. Right. Now uh, you look at this without, uh, right, now we are taking this one. Right. Now here two variables, we are taking absences, number of absences. So definitely 
it is a numerical variable. The number of absences here we are putting as eight. We are taking with the integers, right? And then we are looking at the final grades, marks. So one variable x is the number of absences, and the y variable final grade. Those are the marks in the y axis. So both are quantitative variables. It is a countable, so a discrete variable, but quantitative variable. It is also measurable. We are per measuring with a percentage, quantitative variable, but continuous variable. And then when the number of absences are eight, the marks is 78. We are taking a six or seven students and looking at their, how many absents they are for the classes, how many times they absent, and what is the marks for the particular student. When a student has eight absences, the particular student's marks is 78. Then when a student has two absences, the student is two times absent for a class, the marks is 92. When the student is five absents, the marks is 90. Similarly, we are looking at uh, six, three, uh, seven students and their corresponding absences. The first student is eight absence with 78 marks. The second student is second absence with 92 marks. Similarly, we are observing each and every student absences and the corresponding marks. Then we are plotting them. Here we can look at the tendency. The number of absences are increasing. What happened? The final grades marks also decreasing, right? So this thing we can observe from the scatter time. You can see that the number of absences are increasing. What happened? When the two absences, the marks is very high. But when the absences are eight, the marks is low comparing to this marks. When the absences are very high, the marks is very low. So this indicates the number of absences are increasing. Final grades tends to decrease. So it indicates the relationship between the absent number of absences and the final marks. Right? So here also another scatter plot. We are taking the production uh, volume per day and the cost per day. So we are taking the volume per day. These both are quantitative variables. Uh, and uh, the volume means uh, we can measure in the number of units. So both uh, uh, we can consider the numerical variable and also ratio measurement scale. And the cost and the volume, uh, we can, if it's a uni number of units, then it is a discrete variable. Cost, actually, we are measuring in the rupees, then it is a continuous variable. Right? Even if we are clearly, uh, clearly mentioned, if we are measuring the volume by kilograms or grams, then both are continuous variable, measurable. If number of units we are measuring, then it is a countable, so it is a discrete variable. But both are quantitative variable. So usually cost are depending on the volume. If the volume, based on the volume, we are deciding the cost, right? So we are taking the volume in the horizontal axis. And because cost, depending on the volume, so cost is we are taking on the vertical axis. Usually, which variable is uh, changes independently, that is in the horizontal, and which variable is depending on the other variable, then that is take on the vertical axis. And then we are, uh, when it is the volume is 23, the cost is 125. When the volume is 26, then the cost is around 140. So then like we plot by these marks, scatters, these are the scatter points. Then when we are looking how they are moving, when the volume increasing, how the cost is changing. So volume increasing, cost also increasing. There is a little increase is there. So here also, so there is a positive relationship between the volume and the cost. That means 
both uh, variables are moving on the same direction, right? So now what are the patterns for the scatter diagrams we have? Some of the patterns are here we are looking. If both variables, like the variables in the horizontal axis and the variable in the vertical axis moving in the same direction, then we are saying that positive in the straight line, positive linear relationship. Because if we plotting a drawing a linear line over here, straight line, then most of the points are close to the line. So that is indicates linear relationship. Uh, so when the horizontal values are increases, the values of the vertical uh, axis also increasing. So we say that positive linear relationship. In this case, when we are drawing a line through this line, straight line, most of the points are close to the straight line. So there is a linear relationship. But when the horizontal values are increasing, vertical values are decreasing. So negative relationship, negative linear relationship. In this case, there is no linear relationship because uh, there is a increasing, decreasing, then again increasing. So where there is a non-linear relationship exits or no linear relationship. There is a relationship, but no linear relationship, right? Uh, again, uh, this kind of, uh, there is a basic introduction to this one, but when we are studying the regression analysis in detail, again, we will look at this relationship, right? This is the basic, what is the linear, positive linear relationship, what is the negative linear relationship, what is the no linear relationship we learned. Then again, another uh, plot is a time series plot. Here also, we are studying the pattern between the two variables, but one variable is a time. How one variable is changed over a time. So the time series plot is used to study the patterns in the values of a numerical variable over time. So the numerical variable we measured on the vertical axis and the time period we measured on the horizontal axis, right? So here we are taking the time that is horizontal axis. How the minutes, uh, we are looking at the number of minutes the Robert used on the cell phone, right? Particular person, Robert, how he is using <coughs> the cell phone times for January month, how many units used for February month, how many units used. And we, we want to look at whether these minutes are changing over the time period. But usually, we have to look at the time series points in the regular intervals. So here, the regular intervals we are taking as months. <laughs> right? Usually, we are taking the minutes in the vertical axis and the months in the horizontal axis. Then we are marking January how many minutes and February, how many minutes? Then we are looking at uh, January to February, it's increasing. Uh, then uh, March to April, little decreasing. And then again increasing and the year mostly decreasing. So how the patterns of the cell phone usage changes over the time, right? Then here also, another graph here, we are taking the times as a yearly measurements and number of franchises, right? So we are observing this number of, the changes of number of franchises over the year from the 1994 to 2006. So how the changes are there? From 1994 to 2002 increasing, in a linearly it increasing, and then start to decreasing. Right, from uh, 2002 to 2024, it started to decreasing the number of franchises, right? So the number of franchises is a quantitative variable. <clears throat> we are looking at them over the changes in the pattern year-wise. 
So this is the summary for the data, qualitative data, how we can summarize for quantitative data, how we can summarize, right? And then here also another measure based on the level of measurements and the number of variables, how we are summarizing the data. And then you read it. Uh, what are the general uh, principles we have to follow to look at the graph, uh, to construct the graph? And when the graph is not appropriate, and what are the principles for the excellent graphs we have to look at? And what are the errors we have, have looking at for the bad presentation and good presentations? These are the self-learning I am leaving it as, right? And this is the summary, <coughs> right? So uh, up to we have nearly five hours lectures we take for how we can organize them in the table and them in the uh, diagrams or graphs for both qualitative and quantitative data uh, by one variable and by two variables, right? These are the things we learn. And also we learned how we can get the insights from those tables and the diagrams, right? Uh, so the next class we have to start to learn about the numerical measures. Summarizing the data using the numerical measures. That is also one part of descriptive statistics. The descriptive statistics, two parts. One is uh, summarizing the data with the uh, uh, tables and the uh, graphs. And one is summarizing the data using the numerical measures. So the next thing we have to look at in the numerical measures. Right. So that we'll learn about in the next class. So. I will inform uh, when your next class uh, you have, right? Uh, any doubts you want to ask? So actually today your interaction is not enough. I think you will uh, you didn't uh, learn properly in the previous class. So if you want to more in, have interaction with me, uh, you have to when you are coming to the next class what are the things we learned in the previous classes you have to keep thoroughly otherwise the interactions will be very minimum level so if you want more interaction with me then you have to be ready what are the things we learned in the previous classes that on that points you have to be clear right uh, if it's a, what is the variable name, whether the measurements, all the things we need in even in the following classes also. So when you are coming to the next class, please uh, you learn what are the things we learned in the chapter one and also until what the graphical things, what are the points we learned. These are the things very important to interact with me in the next class. You don't need to learn about what are the things we want to learn in the next class. What are the things we learned in the previous classes? Those points, on those points, you have to be familiar. Right? Uh, once we completed in the numerical measures, you will have your first assessment. Your, so today onwards, still you, ha you have to be prepared for the first assessment. Right? So when you are coming to the next class, Please familiar with what are the things so far we learned from chapter one up to today now. Right. So any comments or anything you want to clarify with me? Otherwise we can end the meeting. <clears throat> So please come uh, to the next class. Uh, the things we you have to be familiar with what are the things you learned in the previous classes and into today, right? So the next class you will be informed through your class rep, right?